I want everybody rise onto your feet. Everybody, those. I, I want you to listen. Why I had to come and say this is this is a man that Jim. Any time I walk to him, he has never turned his back on me. There are times that he does not know. Wait, hold on. There are times that he he does not know that I have hit the wall. But I walk to him and he will just make one phone call. And for so many years, we've been friends. And on behalf of the youth of Ghana, I know there are hundreds of people watching. We are just going to clap for him for 30 seconds to say thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great honor. God bless you. All right. You may be seated. Be lifted above all other gods. We lay our ground and worship you. Oh, be lifted above all other gods. We lay our crowns and worship. Say, oh, glorious God, oh, we praise you. We lay our crowns and worship. Say, oh, glorious God, we praise you. We praise you. We worship. Thank you. Even I'm watching, I'm grateful. Um, for the people you see in this room and those watching us, we continue to say a big thank you. Today you have blessed the minds and hearts of many young Ghanaians. And not because um, you brought one of my favorite actors here. But anytime I watch Jimmy, I go like I should have been an actor myself. Jimmy, you're welcome to Ghana. But for you, you live here already, so you're, you're almost always here. Hello, everyone. Um, we've, we've had the opportunity of engaging one of Africa's most celebrated actors. And he said something that struck me. He's been on the low many times. He's fallen many times, but he never gave up. And that is the spirit that all of us should also have. I'm not here to bore you too much with a long speech, but I'm here to tell you that you should count yourself blessed for being here today. And you'll be more blessed if you join the evening one to listen to one of Ghana's best speakers when it comes to the Christendom family. This year, we're talking about a mind shift. And um, so the gentleman behind Rosalind, can you come? And the lady drinking something there, please come. So what do you want to be in future? Okay, thank you, sir. In future, I want to be a, I wanted to be a lawyer, but uh, it didn't come true. So, like, well, I've always wanted to be a man of God. Yeah. So, let's so what do you want to be in future? I want to be a very great man of God for now. So you want to be a man of God? And how are you working towards it? How are you working towards it? For now, like, I've been building myself spiritually, and I've been coping with lots of spiritual fathers as well. 
And as I'm here to, I'm here to tap into different anointings. So, okay. yeah. Give it to my little sweetheart. Sweetheart, what do you want to be in the future? I want to be a doctor. I want to be a doctor. You know what? So how are you also working hard to us? Sir? So God bless you. So how are you working towards being a doctor? I have to learn hard. You have to learn hard. Okay. So, you go. Thank you. And God is going to bless your heart for you to be the doctor you want to be and for you to be the man of God that you have to be so that you can expand what Reverend Amwating and the team they are doing. Growing up, almost everybody was told what you should become. It's been ingrained in the African DNA. So right from birth, meba we de onye obe doctor. Kwe kunye ese oye pharmacist. Akosia will have to be a nurse. And Ama will have to be a lawyer. So right from birth, very typical of our society, the young child is made to walk a certain path. Whether the person has the capacity or not, and whether that is the cherished dream or not of the child. We've been made to believe that you finish basic school, you finish senior high school, you get to the university, you get to the polytechnic. And then when you complete, this is a cycle that has been drawn for the young Ghanaian and many young Africans. And after that, you have to learn how to write a CV. And the next phase is how to drop those CVs and then follow up on these CVs. That is the path that the society, that our parents, our guardians right from birth. It's like a template. And so the mindset has been that if you are not employed, you are not working. If you are not an employee, you are not working. And we only see entrepreneurship or being an employer as a backup. Colleagues, I've had the opportunity of engaging many young Africans in Namibia, in Nigeria, in Kenya, on the streets of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and recently in Lilungwe in Malawi, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and Abidjan. And the template has been the same. This was the mindset of our Western counterpart and that's of China, Japan, South Korea. But they realize that that cannot be sustainable and that cannot be the future. So we are 22 years late, but thanks to Pastor Brian and the team, we are having a brutally frank conversation on the mind shift. Pastor Brian, we should have had some of you 22 years ago. But we are grateful God gave you to us at this time. And for the people in this room, the timing is apt. Because these are fertile minds who are going to be challenged to move beyond the comfort zone and to break the glass ceiling. China had to move from that third world to a first world. Likewise, Japan and South Korea, the United States, United Kingdom, and those of our counterparts learned this stuff 1950. Every year in Ghana, we churn out 400,000 young graduates. For the last 10 years, we've churned out 4 million. And these are people that we expect them to contribute towards the nation's building. For four million, for the 400,000, 
times 10. The 4 million young Ghanaians over the last 10 years, about 85 to 90 percent of them are still following up on the series that they dropped. And the time comes when such brutally frank conversations, we need to have them. Society has drawn that path that when even some of you see your colleagues going into entrepreneurship and starting something on their own, we look down upon them and say that Onye Jumai, art and culture have defined the rest of, our, of, of the globe. It's only down here in sub-Sahara Africa that we even see art and culture as a secondary way of also going about how to um, make a living. Elsewhere is a big thing. The Americans realize that it's not only enough for them to transport their language, so they transport sports and movies and entertainment. And that is why, regardless of how much countries who hate them and the extent to which they hate them, they never stop buying their movies and they never stop listening to their songs. So authoritarian regimes will try and shut down the networks. But what they don't stop doing is the movies and the songs that this Western world will continue to export. So, it's not new, and I'm not new to this arrangement at all. When I was growing up, I said to myself I wanted to be a pilot. Midway through it, I realized that I didn't have the best of eyesight. But there was something I also wanted to do right from infancy, was also to be in public service. At the age of four, at least, I was following my grandparents when any time they were going about campaigning. Class four, I do recall vividly that any time I was given money, as pocket money for school, to buy food, I normally would buy those times either the Chronicle newspaper or the guide. I never understood what was in it, but I felt some way, somehow, my family was heavily in opposition at that time, when I was a little boy. So I felt by buying a newspaper of the opposition, I'll be contributing towards uh, their advancement into government. So personally, I never read a full storybook. But I learned how to speak English reading the Chronicle newspaper and the guide. I never understood what was in it, but at least I saw the pictures. And I was determined from the very base that I also wanted to be in public service. Why? Because I also felt that that is one way that I can also advocate for reforms and to also help advance the cause of the young people. Thank you, Hilda, my executive assistant, and uh, David Anto, my assistant as well. These are young people that any time I'm conflicted, I ask them of their opinion on a matter. Because sometimes you need to even get people who will tell you the truth. It's a patronizing system. The truth might hurt. The medicine might be bitter, but it's necessary. There are days that I don't want to see their faces, but they, they made sense with what they told me. So we find a way of working together when we are not even talking for a couple of days. Then it will come down, but at least they prick my conscience on things to do. So for the four million people we have created over the last 10 years, I'm here to announce to you that 90% of them, they are still looking for jobs. I'm married to a very courageous wife who left the banking hall to do cleaning. Her family felt that there was something wrong. And I also at that time felt the same, that you're working with a very good bank. At least you are paid eight to five. 
to wake up one morning and say, you know, I want to go clean people's offices. It didn't make too much sense. But it shouldn't make sense when you want to defy the odds. And she started with one employee, that's herself. And she has 500 employees today. So the courage that sometimes we need to move beyond our comfort zone. Some of us looking out for the opportunities, we don't even look out for them. One of the best places to look out for networks and opportunities is in this room. And it's here at IS. And consistently, it's been IS. People have been blessed, people have been networked, and people are making it. I'll start by the story of my sister as well, the young lawyer. She decided to do the extraordinary. I was excited when I walked in and when the song was being played and sung and I saw lots of the young people dancing to it. It's good to bend the energy, bend the fat. But beyond it, you need to also take a critical look at what you want to do beyond today. I asked my five-year-old daughter this morning, so what do you want to be in future? She said she wants to be a policewoman. I asked why. She said that is what she thinks she would be very good at. And I, I actually encouraged her. The time that we look down on certain jobs, I think has been one of the biggest tragedies of our continent. On vacation and during vacation, at the uni level, people travel outside to do cleaning, clean people's offices, and to do uh, car parking duties. But here in Ghana, you ask that graduate to do it, he will tell you, how do you see me? So we are comfortable building other people's economies and nations, but we feel reluctant to build that of our own. I have a very good friend from the Conservative Party in the UK, and he asked me a question during the 2008 recession. So, so Sammy, how have you guys been coping with the recession? I pretended not to hear the question. And uh, he asked again. And I said, we have been in recession ever since you guys started colonizing us and left. So for us, we are used to the management of this recession. What we are currently looking at is how to get better after the recession. Now there's a growing trend, which will not be colonialism, but is likely to be e-colonialism. That's economic colonialism. Because if somebody's country, if you have the Western power shifting focus from an employee-based economy to an employer-based economy since 1950, you will definitely be going to them all the time for support. They won't invite you to come for the support. You will come for that support. And when you come, that's, that's when they read the riot act to you. They didn't call you for the support. You said you need that support. And so a time comes when sacrifices must be born sometimes in our supreme interest. If you're very good at packaging, learn the best out of packaging. If you're very good at fixing things, please let it be stated on record that there lives somebody here who was very good at this job. I'm not too sure if I'm a bad boy, but I've been a bad boy before, together with my very good friend here, when we were in school, St. Augustine's. Our school 
had no wall, but he had a gate. Man of God, I'm happy to see you. That was my classmate. And his story inspires me. I'm not too sure there's any brand of marijuana he has not smoked before. Unless the new one's coming. Man of God, I'm not putting you on the spot. So when he sees the little, little ones being smoked, eh, he laughs over it. Because he's tried every face and bridge. Himself and I, we did break bounds on several occasions. After school, God called him to be a minister of God. God called me to also do politics. <laughs> but the only difference between the politician's platform and the pastor's pulpit is that here you shout hallelujah and we shout choboy. So when you come to stand in front of a gathering of God's people, if you don't take it easy, your opening statement might be Choboy when it should be hallelujah. And that's why I don't mix the two. Anytime I come to stand on a pulpit and I'm converting this place into God's temple because the man of God is seated. So I had to keep quiet soak the music, and lay my crown before I talk. The discussion we're having here today, someday you have to play back in your mind. Say to yourself, it is possible because you have the energy. It is possible because you have the passion. And it is possible because you can do it. Don't let anybody push you into a profession that you may not be attracted to. Let the mind shift be from being a totally employee-driven to how you two you can employ your brother or sister. There are several things that can turn into gold in our hands. Madame was talking about how she started with 100 bottles. Some of us, you see these same bottles and you play chaskele with them. Somebody saw the refuse. You saw it as rubbish. But Dr. Japon of Zoom Lion saw it as fortune. The very things you throw away, he comes to collect them for you. And he charges you for collecting them. People named him Bola Man. But he is a millionaire. For everything you are good at, don't let anybody dim your confidence. After school, when I decided that I wanted to take this public service far, I was lucky to have had a job in the UK, working with the Abbey National Bank, now Santander. After I was confirmed and after my probation, I still knew that I wasn't an eight to five person. Some of them may turn out as a panel is a problem. So I decided that, look, that time my party had lost power in 2008. There needed to be a new beginning of young people to rise up to the occasion through advocacy, through civil society. And I came down to join a team to have the Alliance for Accountable Governance, that time that had been formed. I came down from UK at that time the flex was M95, a mobile phone that I had. And I never got tired talking and moving from station to station to make a case for reforms, for this, for that. One evening, I attended a program with an NDC colleague of mine. I think I spoke very well. It was late into the evening. When the show closed, 
I was looking forward to getting TNT from the accountant at that TV station. The accountant had closed. It was 9.30 p.m. The guy who could help me, I won't mention his name, who was the NDC colleague at that time, and later on became a member of parliament. If I give too much details, they will know him. And he was upset with me because I had really taken on his government. So when we finished the program, he sat in his car and left. Accountant two had closed. Me and my N95 alone. I also lived at Taifa. He stepped out of the building and it was raining heavily. Heavily. I began a journey of hope to walk from Abilene area to Taifa. This was around 10:15 thereabout. So it was more of Jama kind of walking. Go to the Achimota Forest area. At least I was talking to somebody on the phone on this N95, which was my only property at that time, and keeping it safe. Only for some. I want to be. I, 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 I want. I, I, this is a house of God, so I want to put it right. Only for some two strangers on a motorbike around the Chimota Forest. Gave him some two good slaps, took the phone, and said, next time don't make call, took the phone away. <laughs> Anytime I record the story, I always have to make sure my phone is in my pocket. I walked from that place to Taifa. Got to Taifa, just after midnight, still in the rain. As I laid in my bed, there were two things. To go back to the UK, where I had my siblings, or to still carry on with the fight here. Unfortunately, it was light off. So it was a catastrophe on a catastrophe. But when I woke up the next morning, I said, giving up is not an option. Phone or no phone. Transport or no transport. I really want to pursue this, my politics and public service. And I never look back. I quite remember when I returned from UK, my parents were quite angry. I have four sisters, lovely sisters. They were not talking to me for months deciding to leave UK to Ghana. They never understood it because your decisions should not make sense to people. Your life-changing decisions should not make sense to people. If you want to make everybody happy, then you have to sell ice cream. That's the only way that people will be happy because everybody gets to smile. But breaking the glass ceiling, it demands, it requires that you go through the painful process. Every great man or great woman has a scar, either emotional or physical. When they decide to share their story with you and they decide to show you the physical one, the physical one reminds them of that face. And the emotional one, they either shed tears telling you, or it's a point that changed their lives. So I want to encourage you here today. Today you are lucky that your fees are being paid. You are lucky that people are providing for your needs. Today you can call home and say, me sheto asa, me we asa. A time will come, you will have to pay everything yourself. You guys came in together. 
because you are coming for the program. But you were offered admissions individually. So your life cycle is not a mirror that your next door neighbor was given the same template. I believe that in this particular room, I am convinced that IS will produce our fertile minds for the next phase of our development. So in wrapping up, let it be known that you are determined to do something different from the four million graduates we produce over the last 10 years. That 85 to 90 percent of them are still following up on CVs. Be creative, be innovative. Let social media add on to what you can do to change your future. The conditions that you face today might be fearsome, but I believe so are your strength. Live your life as if nobody's with you on this journey. Learn hard whatever you are doing today. And also open up your mind for things you are good at. We don't have a robotic station, but you had Manfred girls on the mountains competing in world robotics and coming out as champions. So don't think that where you are seated today, there's no hope. Never did people ever envisage that a black man could lead the free world. But Barack made it. Maybe someday you'll be the one to even lead Africa. And never think that it's too big for you. Pastor Brian never started on an IS platform. He conceived the idea, nurtured the idea, worked towards the idea. And I listened to Amanda, the EcoBank lady who came to stand here. You could see that she's also on her own career path. Ask yourself, what do I want to also become someday for people to also sit among the audience and listen to me? So I want to challenge you. Move beyond your comfort zone. Let's make that paradigm shift. It's not enough for you to be told at birth that you should be a nurse. As you keep growing, what are you good at? She is a lawyer but has identified the entrepreneurship skill. You might be working towards being a journalist. But when you reflect, I am trusting God to also give you a second opinion of whatever you are doing and how God should bless your handiworks. Thank you. I don't know if there are a couple of questions for me. Okay, so I'll come to you. If you did, I didn't get the question, then I know there's trouble because Jimmy did. <laughs> okay, thank you. Please, my name is Solomon. Yes, Solomon. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the youth of Ghana. Thank you. We are tired. Honorable, we are tired not because we have not tried, we have tried. Mm. I started the school in Brekum. It's about 11 hours from here. My aim was to bridge the gap between private schools and public schools because at the university I did education. And I realized that the methods we are using in the private schools and that of public schools are not the same. So we started the school and we made the school free. The parents were supposed to buy textbooks for their wards. Now these poor parents are not able to buy the textbooks. Can you imagine that for almost two years, 
um, Senate and Internal Revenue has taken us to court. Every two weeks, we go to court to pay money to them because, because they said we are not paying tax and all that. But the school is also not making income. Now, what I'm saying is that you see a very people have taken the school and they are now bringing it back to me. Children leave our school, go to these established schools which individuals who have capital to run it are doing it. And they become checks in that school. But in our school, they don't have position. Now, Honorable, my question is, what is the commitment of youth agency to help individuals who want to do something? Because in all the forums, they say we should do something. What is the commitment of the agency? Number two, what is the commitment of the government to reveal some of these um, six things? Because... It's like the, the systems are there to take advantage over us, and we are tired. Thank you. Okay. So, Solomon, thank you. I think it's a very genuine concern. First of all, you are not making profit. And two, tax authorities will not let you have the peace of mind and manage the kids there. That's in Brekum, east or West. West. Um, Agogo as the MP. Uh, where to Myanmar was? Nelson. Okay, good. Um, I think I also take up the, the name of the school and I'll personally follow up on it. Because sometimes you could have somebody taking advantage of the fact that you are even in competition with another school. <laughs> The mindset and the capacity of our own people. The capacity of our own people to sometimes be unfriendly. When I say our own people, I'm talking about our own people as Ghanaians. So I'll definitely take that, but because it sounds very interesting to me. And then again, your issue of sometimes you feel like you're working hard, but the kind of support is not there. When I was at the YE, there was something that I saw they, when I was at the YE as board chairman. And I've had the opportunity of being youth leader for the MPP as well. You could see somebody going to Codvet. That's the council for the tertiary vocational and educational training. The person will go there and get support after going to apprenticeship. This person moves from there and goes to NEP. National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Plan, get support. The person moves from there and come to YEA with a proposal, get support from YEA. And the last thing you see has gone to National Youth Authority saying they are doing collaboration capacity building. One person will walk through to block the channels and the blessings of other colleagues who might badly need that help. So I think that if you ask me, the commitment of government for me has not been the question. But even how we monitor those who take advantage for me remains one of the mysteries of the system. So one person will end up getting support of, the person is just 20,000 from Codvet, will get 20,000 from NEP, will go to YEA with a program and get like 30,000 and all that. He needs 50,000 to start, but you end up getting about 100,000. And then how do we even monitor these colleagues six months down the line to see what they use the monies and use the support that the government or the system or the agencies give them? So then it becomes a cycle of unemployment. So your, the Solomon's issue is a very interesting case. And I'll personally follow up. So Solomon, whilst the, the government is doing its part, Amongst ourselves too, I think we also need to challenge ourselves to also serve as a monitoring device. Because I've, I've said it and I keep saying, if you set aside a billion cities to help youth unemployment, 
and we don't block the loopholes in the system. That one billion cities which, are, which can go to support 100,000 young people to, for startup or as entrepreneurs. If you don't take care, that one billion cities will only end up supporting 50 people. Because one person can make sure that he goes through the system. Someone told me an interesting story yesterday. He said, now for many people, when the laws are being passed, they, they don't ask of the content in the law, they ask of the loopholes in the law. So they are thinking ahead of the loopholes in the system. So my good friend and my brother, take it as a personal commitment to follow up this. But please, it's not about you just giving up on the school. It's about the future of the young people who could have turned out to be like the Reverend Brian and Jimmy and, and all those uh, good people that we can. Never give up. And I believe it, it remains a struggle. A very good friend of mine that I helped, one gentleman who wanted to get into the security agencies. I helped him get a form. He applied, kept encouraging. I followed up. Then he got one of the agencies. He got it and he told me, and he, he comes from a rural place. Came to me and said, oh, now but when, when I pass out of the training, I want to be stationed in Accra. And I asked him, so who should take care of those in the village? In fact, that even helped me to lobby for them to send him up somewhere. <laughs> because I realized that he, he didn't mean well. I'm happy to say that he settled very well wherever he is. Twelve months down the line, he's now taking care of his sick mother and the siblings. If you are watching us live on the social media pages, let's move beyond our comfort zone. Rosalind, is there any? Uh, we'll merge it so that we okay. can answer together. Good morning. It's afternoon, sir. Sorry, afternoon. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my name is Delade. Okay. And this question I'm about to pose is centered on mental health. Okay. So I would like to ask, what are the measures, the NYA, that's the National Youth I'm no longer with the YA. The youth I employment used a, I used to be a board chair for the youth employment. But it's good, you can ask as well. At least I'm still a youth activist, so it would be good to still get my colleagues who are not here and then get them to also act on. So, I'm now with the NLA as Director General. Yeah, 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 right. relax. What, has, what are the measures the NYA is putting in place to ensure that educational institutions are open to curb issues on mental health? Okay. Okay, let's take the second one as well. All right, thank you. My, my name is Kobiche. Senior, your slang is too much, so I can't hear my name is Kobe Chi. Okay. All right. Now, so uh, God bless Pastor Brian for putting this together. So I am a living testimony of IS, and uh, it has shaped my mind. Now, I have, uh, probably have to just put them together. Number one, it's about youth policies in Ghana. Uh, I chanced on the 2010 youth policy for the, the youth. I mean, policies that was designed for the youth. And when you read beautiful policies, it looks as if on paper we see them, but implementing it and we the youth of Ghana being part of nation development has become a problem. So I beg of you that in your capacity, try as much as possible that when you put things on paper for the youth of Ghana, you can push it for us. Now I like the fact that you also call two young kids to ask them about what they want to do in future. And again, when you were speaking, you mentioned our mindset and looking at China, South Korea, and all. Now, you notice that they have the environment because like a kid in China, we start creating apps. A lot of things that these children in the Western world are doing. When you come to Africa and Ghana for that matter, when you go on social media, you see a lot of 
children who are very innovative. You see them, true of us, very innovative. Today they are creating this. And to build a society or to build a nation, we need people like this, skillful people. So it looks as though, like you mentioned, we want to respect those who speak the English, those who be in the suit and tie, but those who can do something, those who are skillful, we are not investing into them. Back in the days, pre-technical schools were very active, vocational schools. Now you're in Ghana, you're still on social media. The Western world are now telling us that if you, have, if you are a driver, if you can cook, if you can do this, come, then our people will just go and go and build the nation. So I feel that let's also help the innovative uh, 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 youth in Ghana, let's empower them so that they wouldn't have the edge in traveling abroad to build their nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll start um, from the first uh, question. I think that um, policymakers will definitely will have to do more when it comes to our mental health policies and advocacies. And we also, as a people, should be cautious on how we also stigmatize people with that. It's just like the cells. Those in jail, not all of them are guilty of the crimes they committed. Some of them, they are in jail because at that point in time, they couldn't get the very best of excuses or the reasons to exonerate themselves. So once you, you begin to think that almost everybody in jail is guilty, then you make a mistake. It's just like our mental health. Even in the situation where our mental health hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, and all you have people doing donations, good people in society, and strangely, we always target the orphanages. And we always target the widows. I think that our generosity should also go beyond just these bodies. And for me, to also target that of the prisons and that of mental health. My understanding is that we're working and through the Ministry of Health in getting a very solid mental health policy program so that right from just the basic level, because today if you go to many of the schools, I'm talking about even the basic ones, you definitely see some, some children with some strange behavior. And you have parents and families sometimes even turning their back on these children at that basic level. And I am sometimes saddened by it. However, I think it's a conversation that should not end just on an IS platform. It should not just be left in the hands of just policymakers, but also reaching out to them from where you sit. And sometimes people just need words of encouragement that it's going to get better. And encouraging them that with these steps and these practices, and listening to what the experts are saying, you're likely to come out of it. Nobody can anticipate the time of disaster. It's like a fish caught in a creel net or a bird caught in a wicked trap. So are humans caught at a time of calamity when it suddenly falls upon them. On the issue of our youth policies, so, Ghana launched a youth policy, national youth policy, in 2010. The implementation document was produced in 2015. The policy, we had one launched in 2010. The 2010 youth policy, we used the 2000 population and housing census data to launch the youth policy for 2010. So already you have 10 years gap with a lot of changes, the dynamics and all totally changed. So you are using even a data which is 10 years old to propose policies for 2010. So apart from 
using the 2010 data, which was 10 years old, to have a youth, a youth policy in 2010. Then we also committed a greater sin by implement, having an implementation plan which was launched in 2015. Fast forward, we now just also finished another population and housing census. So we are going to go through another cycle of using either data for 2010 or we may have to do a better arrangement in using a current data that speaks to the various changes geographically, various changes in terms of the educational background, in terms of economic background. So Chief, in answering you clearly, anytime you, maybe you have been lucky to read through, through the policies, but when you read through, some of it you think it, we've either gone past it or we are about going past it. And some of them you think that it could have also been properly situated in our context. My worry is that the active participation of young people when it comes to this discourse and making serious input into such a document, let's first of all get the document prepared. And then when you have the document prepared, we move to its implementation. If you are not part of the decision-making process and you leave just policy makers, it will not work. You call for stakeholder engagement and you will have people who are not youth coming into sitting to represent the youth. They can only be sympathetic to the cause, but he who lives in it feels it. So that also my, my contribution to that question will be that yes, um, the policy and the youth policy document, for me, it may need some few additions to it to meet the future goals and aspirations. In the next few months, if we are not, we are currently competing in the job market with technology. It remains your biggest opponent now. So things that five people could do, 10 people could do, thanks to technology, one person can get it done. So maybe in thinking through how well do we get ahead of the game? You spoke about that of the Chinese, that of the Japanese, and that of the South Koreans as I wrap up. 1950s, they might have faced the same thing. And that is why Ghana refers to the Asian tigers of Malaysia, South Korea, and all. We might have started that same checkered journey with them. But I think the greatest weapon that they decided to hold on to was developing their human potential. If you are good at fixing gutters, they make sure you're encouraged to do that. If you are good at, with a creative hand and mind in electronics, you are encouraged to do that. But here, if you are looking for somebody to inspire you, my young friends, you'll be making the biggest mistake of your life. Take inspiration from yourself. And you say to yourself that it is possible, I have the passion, I have the energy, and I won't look back. People who haven't looked back, They've been able to break the glass ceiling. It's just like the eagle, when it soars, it knows where it wants to end, and so it never gets distracted. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sami Awuku, the people's Awuku. Thank you.